All right. Hi, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer. I'm also a developer advocate at Egalia. And uh, on today's show, we're going to talk with a, a guest. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Philip Jagenstedt. Uh I'm a software engineer on the Google Chrome team. And yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for being here. Yeah, definitely. And uh, if you know Philip, uh, you probably know him as uh, Fulip is his handle on most things, which I think is just like that's the, right. the best screen name. I love it. Uh, maybe second only to SV Jesus, which I think is <laughs> great. really <laughs> also great a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're going to talk about Interop 2023, which I think the third, is it the third installment of this collaboration or the fourth? I we might count it as a third, right? We yeah. had Interop 2022. And then before that, we had something called Compat 2021, um, right. which is, well, we renamed it, uh, but it's the third uh, spiritually in the series. And what it is, is uh, sort of a collaboration between browser vendors and people who work on the platform, the implementation specs, to work together to prioritize improving the interoperability of things, right? That's right. Yeah. And uh, trying to focus on things that we think matter to, to web developers and, and users, but mainly web developers. So it seems like a weird thing. Um, I'm going to just be honest, like it, it's, it's really great that uh, we're doing this. Everybody's like really excited about it, but just to step back, it, it feels like a thing that shouldn't exist. <laughs> right. I can see what you mean. Um, yeah. Because if it is a standard, it should be interoperable, right? Like those two things go very hand in hand. Hmm. I wonder if that's really the case in any kind of industry. Do you just write the standard and then everything works? Like it depends on the industry. I can actually speak to this a little bit. Um, as an example, uh, the the DVD standard, the industry figures out how to make everything interoperable. And then once they've done that, then they write down the specification. So rather than writing everything down and then trying to get people to adhere to what was written down, they literally just, they document what was worked out between the competitors in the marketplace. So, I mean, it used to be that the W3C was absolutely the complete reverse of that where a working group would would write a specification uh, of you know this is what we think people will want, and then it was up to implementers to implement that or not, which is why we have a number of features in or had a number of features in HTML and CSS and and other uh, standards, quote unquote, where things just never got implemented, right? Because there was no interest from implementers in doing it. Well, let's talk about like where did we get the interop effort. Do you want to give us some like background? Sure. Yeah, we can go pretty far back. Um, I think maybe we can talk about, you know, web platform tests and the origins of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the interop effort is not synonymous with web platform tests by any means, but I mean, it's, it's building on that foundation. Um, so web platform tests, um, it goes, it feels like just a, a staple of our industry now, I guess it's it's just there, but it wasn't always there. Um, uh, before web pattern tests, there were these pretty high profile tests like the the acid tests. There was an HTML test suite, and then somewhere along the way, I don't know the exact year it was, web pattern tests was was formed, bringing together, uh, I think, uh, the HTML test suite, maybe some some DOM test suites, and sort of over time. It, it grew into a bigger and bigger thing. And eventually it just became the test suite for the web platform or almost the whole web platform. We still have uh, ECMAScript tested separately, for example. Um, so that is really a very long sort of progression from, from no interop testing to interop testing um, by default almost. So Tim Berners-Lee created the first browser in what like 1991 and very quickly we got a bunch of browsers we got the w3c in 1995 and it was 2013 when uh toby langle blogged about reaching the amazing point where we had one percent of the platform then had web platform tests yeah since we're naming names i i i didn't know the exact dates but my jar it's 2013 um 
another person who you know did a lot for web platform test early and still is, is James Graham from, from Mozilla. I think he sort of built the whole infrastructure. So that's, I think, Mozilla overall. Uh, they were the first to use web platform tests as sort of a one of their own test suites. And then Chromium came along, I don't know how many years later, three years, something like that, before Chromium started using it uh, sort of as a serious test suite, that's, let's say. Yeah, but 2013, that is that is pretty recent still. It's 10 years, but uh, compared to the age of the web, it's recent, I suppose. That's your point. Yeah, I mean, I think that the whole effort really got started about halfway or, or mm -hmm. even a little past halfway into the lifespan of the web. Um, and it's huge, right? I mean, like the web, the API surface between 2013 and now is <laughs> grown really, really, really fast, right? And so we have to create tests and get on interoperability on every new thing that we add. Plus, yeah. we still have so much to finish of the stuff that was around before, right? So yeah. this, I think the thing that I would like to mention, though, is uh, the MDN uh, compat survey. Mm. Um, can somebody maybe? Yeah, I know something about that. But before the compat survey, there was the uh, developer needs assessment, web DNA. Um, so that was in 2019, the first of those. Uh, that was a, a Mozilla effort. And I think at the time, it must have been the largest survey, like the largest web developer survey that was ever done. And it was done two years in a row, 2019 and 2020. And what we saw from that was a pretty clear sort of cluster of issues that we identified as you know, top, top pain points that had to do with browser compatibility or supporting different browsers or avoiding a certain thing because it doesn't work in a browser or it was something about layouts as well that had to do with this. So among the top 10 issues in the sort of main pain point question of, of those surveys, I think four or so were about this browser compatibility or interoperability problem. So I noticed that and um, this was sort of my thing even then. Uh, so I wanted to learn more. And so we, together with with uh, with Mozilla, we did this follow-up deep dive called the Browser Compatibility Report. Um, and that again was a survey. And we asked sort of more detailed questions about, you know, what parts of the, of the web platform do you have trouble with? Um, and we also did interviews with, I think, 10 or 15 people, really long surveys, uh, sorry, really long interviews. And we wrote that up all in a report and just sort of published our findings. And big picture, what you could say is a lot of the the pain points have to do with CSS or, or layout. And so that's where I focused a lot right after that, because that's what the data seemed to be pointing at. Not exclusively layout, but it sure was a sort of cluster of, of issues there. And Flexbox and Grid were like the two main issues in that subcategory. I guess like part of me would like to speculate something here, which is that CSS layout is, um, well, anything in CSS is really hard to polyfill. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the, um, the pain that you would experience a as a developer is kind of a lot more obvious than if let's say, you know, some common JavaScript API isn't implemented because we have like plenty of ways to work around that. Now we have, the polyfills and transpiling and things like that, that we can relieve a lot of the pain. Um, so complete speculation on my part, <laughs> but maybe that has something to do with why those pains seem to be more vocal. Um, but why do you reckon grid and flexbox? Why aren't, weren't people complaining about table layout and, and floats? Does that have something to do with the age of those features or? You, you bring up an interesting point with like floats and table layout, um, which uh, makes me want to say like, oh, kids today <laughs> complaining about interoperability. I mean, yeah, back yeah. in the day, back in my day. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Which maybe is a interesting point to turn and say that, do um, you know who started the tests for CSS in the first place. Well, I haven't looked at the first commit. Um, who so was it? The, well, he is the person who hasn't spoken much on this call. Yeah. And not talking in WPT, Brian's referring to the original CSS1 test suite. 
Uh huh. Which I uh, created in the mid nineties. Um, mostly for my own edification, but then I shared it with the work. Oh, I shared it with SV Jesus, who we mentioned earlier, Chris Lilly, mm. who was chair of the working group at the time and said, Hey, would this is working group at all interested in having something like this that I, you know, put together to try to figure out how CSS works. And he said, would you mind if I shared this with browser vendors? It's like, no, I wouldn't mind at all. Um, but yeah, that's what became the official CSS one test suite was, was about 85% the tests that I wrote oh, and wow. added things like uh, acid one. Um, the, the first acid test uh, Todd Farner put together, we got his permission to include that in the CSS one test suite. So, right. so as I said, a few, a few features came out sort of on top. We had Flexbox, we had grid, um, but we also had a cluster of issues that had to do with scrolling um, that were interesting. And so we took what we learned from that and we tried to just put together you know, a, a list of, of features that we could prioritize uh, together and and improve on. So we uh, we worked. So Google uh, worked with Microsoft on on that and came up with a list of five things, among them Flexbox and Grid that we thought would make sense to to prioritize. And yeah, then we announced that and called it Compat twenty twenty one. Compat after you know the browser Compat survey, but you know. Might as well call it interop, and uh, and off we go. Um, so it was really off the success of Compat twenty twenty one that I think everyone came to the table for interop twenty twenty two and and now interop twenty twenty three. This this model of of focusing on a small number of things, small ish, really made a difference. Uh, focus prioritization. So we had tried for years to treat web platform tests as a sort of monolith, a whole, and uh, try to have metrics for test failures and, and triage all failing tests, this sort of thing. But it was very difficult. And I think I've heard this was the sort of experience at Mozilla as well, that uh, when you try to approach it as a whole, you know, it's just this big bucket of, of mess and nobody really knows what to do with it. So I think boiling it down to you know, a smaller number of things uh, that we knew were important for other reasons, not just because they're failing, but because developers are struggling with those things, that really was key, I think. And that's the model that we've uh, continued to, to follow. Yeah, we, we also were involved in Compat 2021 and uh, we thought it was a great effort. We liked that it expanded into 2022 and it got some, some more people involved. With 2022, I also wrote a, a web almanac chapter about that. Right. Go read. I think Eric and Philip were both reviewers for that chapter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't know if we'll continue that. I, I kind of hope we do. But I think it's an interesting idea that, as you say, it's difficult for browser vendors because the needs, the ask of the platform are everything. The amount of things being actively worked on is still almost everything. And that's being worked on by someone. But then you have to convince everybody else to work on it until it gets to done. And how do you prioritize what to work on is very difficult. And how do you prioritize what things to assign engineering time to and spec people to make sure that we have all the details that we need for good interoperability and I think that's where interop has been really successful. And another thing that I really like about what we've done with interop is some mix of the things that we include are things that are brand new. Yeah, that's right. And that wasn't, you know, a given that we should do that. Um, let's see. I don't think compact 2021 had things that were totally unimplemented, but I'm not sure. Um, but interop 2022 certainly did. Aspect um, ratio, I think, was part of 2021. That was brand new. Yes, yes, you're right. It was. It's um, the only one that pops into my mind. But yeah, um, but I think you know if we have you know, clear web developer, web developer demand for a new thing that solves a problem, and we can all agree that it's important, then just it's, it's great that we can do that. Um, but usually when we talk about interoperability and testing, you know, we're talking about the the things that are implemented and you know the the messy corner the messy corner cases but i do think there's really value in 
prioritizing new things at the same time and focusing really on the quality of those things as well. Get it right to begin with, then maybe we don't have five years or 10 years of low level pain before it's sort of all the um, rough edges are are filed off. Yeah, I just think there's such an outsized impact for these things that, you know, we do that are like front loaded like that, because um, I'm not even sure you can compare them <laughs> because I think it's in part like related to the thing that when you asked, like, why do we have so much feedback about grid and flexbox and not so much about things like tables and floats? It's like, because, you know, those are promises that we haven't kept in a long time, tables and floats, right? Whatever problems remain there, people have had to move past that. Like they've had to, you know, find ways to work around it. It's not at the front of their attention anymore. They, anyway, they want grid and flexbox for most of those challenges anyway. So this is like the, the, I hate to use this term, but it's like, this is the new hotness. This is the thing that is meant to currently alleviate my pain. I like the way it's supposed to alleviate my pain. And like, so it's getting a lot of scrutiny and, uh, but, uh, I think that there's just like this huge, huge difference between this idea of like the, the new things and the old things. And I think that the other part of this outsized difference is that like, I don't want to say you only get a chance to make a first impression once, but like regular developers, they, they have finite time too. Right. And when the default mode is everybody does their own prioritization of all these things. It means that there's no, like, when does the new thing arrive? It's like, we don't know. Like we get a first implementation, we get a bunch of talks, we get a bunch of blogs, we get maybe some, some podcasts and we're like a whole bunch of people go, wow, cool. I can't wait to use that. It like, let me pull it up. And they're like, oh, it works in only one browser. Uh, and you know, that can carry on for in, in some cases, historically for five, six, 10 years, uh, before the first one and the last one. And there's real challenges with that because implementation scrutiny often helps shape the spec. So by the time you get to the third spec, sometimes you have to debate about like, well, you know, what are we going to do now? Because <laughs> this doesn't make sense the way that it's implemented in the first one, um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that in every aspect of this, there's just like a really, really outsized uh, impact to being able to like communicate a thing and have a degree of trust and have a good feedback loop. Uh, I can't say enough about how much I think we probably gain from like front loading prioritization. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. Um when there's excitement for a feature and then you realize you can't actually use it yet, then I guess you forget about it. And and I think developers, the web platform is more capable than developers think it is because they assume things are worse than, than they are um, mm -hmm. based on experience. I think that's probably happening. Um, so yeah, and so w what we have is a coordination problem. We're all implementing a bunch of features uh, but at different times and announcing them at different, uh, you know, at, at our own pace. And so it's totally un uncoordinated. But I think if if we coordinate a little bit, then it's actually just a win-win for everyone. It's less work for everyone and the, and the result is better. So, uh, yeah, I view it as a coordination problem. And uh, uh, even if sort of interrupt shouldn't exist in a sense, then I think coordination should exist. Um, because for developers, you know, the, the web platform is not just one browser. It's whatever browsers they have in the support matrix. And until it's there solidly, then the feature doesn't exist. So coordination. Just to be like, really add some clarity to the thing that I was saying about interop shouldn't exist. Interop should exist. Uh, there shouldn't be a separate project called interop uh, in, in an ideal world. Right. This is what standards would do. Right. Standards and tests, right? Um, because I think Part just web, well, well, maybe in an ideal world. Yeah. Um, right. But there is an, there's an interesting sort of other universe, uh, which is ECMAScript, which doesn't have an interop program and maybe doesn't need one. I'm not like super into ECMAScript and TC39, but, you know, from a, a distance, it looks like things work quite differently there. Uh, the test suites. It looks pretty solid, 
browsers generally just try to pass all the tests uh, and then say the feature is done. So there's none of this sort of pass, everyone passes 80% of the tests and it's not the same 80%. If the test is, tests are solid and everyone tries to pass them all, then there you go, you have interop without um, all this coordination. So there is a different model out there. And uh, I'm always interested in sort of what can we learn from from that? Is, is there a downside to it? Does it move slower because of it? I'm not totally sure about that, but yeah, it sure is different. ECMA 262, the test suite, also similarly added late in the game. Um, I think 2010 is when that came about. And um, I think that it was first used for ES6. Like, so yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I think they're all different. I mean, like, I know we have people here who do work in other standards bodies, like Kronos, for example. And um, like Vulkan has a conformance test suite, just as an example. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, there's so many models to this. I, I really do think that would be like an interesting show all by itself to just talk about like the different models and everything. Yeah, and about what the place of testing in the standards process is, because that's also radically different between uh, like the what WG, WTC working groups, um, and TC39. Yeah, and, and like what do you call a standard, right? So th this is maybe an interesting thing to broach into how some of this is very difficult to, to discuss in a way that is really productive, right? Because that's, that's what we care most about. I mean, at least us, that's what we care most about, just being really as productive as we can. And um, there are lots of potentially interesting ways to look at this information, right? Like uh, you could say like, well, what only fails a test in a single browser? That's an interesting thing, right? That would be mm -hmm. an interesting thing to look at. It could be a, a way to help organize your priorities. Yeah, we've tried that one. It but there are actually things that are in the HTML standard that have tests. They're implemented in two browsers and that one browser like has been vocal since the beginning that they think that that's just wrong. You know, they, they're not going to add it. And I don't know what is, <laughs> is yeah. it standard or isn't it right? That's a tricky, I think, uh, that the most useful definition of standard is like what, where the rubber hits the road, right? <laughs> when all three of them agree and we have interoperability, that's a really good standard. Well, even the even the W2C doesn't have that bar. Well, and so in in a way the what WG has a as a higher bar and in a way the W2C has a higher bar, they're not exactly comparable, but um so the the what WG sort of working mode is you, know, you need if two implementers want to work on something, then it's worth writing down so they can be interoperable. And if a, mm -hmm. if a third implementation doesn't care so much about the thing, um it can still go in the spec. At the W through C, I guess we're talking about the 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 exit criteria from, I don't know, rec or something, uh, and having two implementations pass pass tests. So there also it's not saying all implementations need to support the feature for it to be a recommendation, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, even say uh, test two six two has similar debatable things where. Like, what does it mean that you need to have so many implementations? Like, for a lot of us, what we mean is the browser implementations, but that's not necessarily the case. Like, conceivably, at least, I'm not sure if it's still this way, but it was a few years ago, um, you could have zero browser implementations. <laughs> and, you know, but you have implementations in some other engines, so that, that counts. In practice, that doesn't seem to be a big problem, but... It it does create situations like this where like it's a little bit tricky to define. Yeah, I mean this is something that I think probably sort of should be left to not to standards organizations, but to places like MDN to say, hey developers, these are things that you can rely on. Um, yeah, I mean who who cares what color the spec is or if it says it's good or not? Um, ultimately, yeah, what that's my position. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that doesn't quite exist. Um, but if 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 you could go to a feature and and see, yes, I can depend on this, and call it standard or call it what you will. That's that's what matters at the end of the day, um, not the uh, the spec status, uh, yeah, say or right. or the test results. 
I hold up a lot uh, web speech because um, hmm. it's not a standard track thing and it's implemented in all three engines. Yeah. All the rest is great. It's all great ways to get agreement and get prioritization and interoperability, like, but they're all part of the process, right? The ultimate thing that as a developer you want is to know, well, that works everywhere, right? And I think that's part of the reason why interop is great is because we want everybody to have that feeling that like, oh, that's good. That works everywhere. Yeah, exactly. And I, I hope that, you know, that's you know something that web developers get excited about, that they can depend on new features actually arriving and them being, you know, solid from, from the get-go. Um, so take a feature like uh, it has a pseudo, pseudo class or that, you know, um, they see it's, it's, it's in this project and um, soon enough, they're going to be able to rely on it. And, you know, next to that, you have fixes to existing features like grid, flexbox, uh, even border image, this ancient uh, technology still needs some polish. I think, I, and I, like I could be wrong, this is just my own personal experience and the experience of people that I have talked to, but um, it does feel a lot of times like, you know, we get this news cycle. This thing is coming. This thing is coming. This thing is coming. This thing is coming. And then I don't know, like maybe it takes kind of a long time. I know you just used the example of, of has. Um, mm. Do you know when the first time that concept entered the CSS specifications? Ooh, I don't know. As has, I suppose it can't be more than a few years. But No, no, it has been a long, long time. So um, it was originally introduced by uh, Danielle Glasman in 1998. We were already starting CSS3 specifications. Then it was just going to be CSS3. It was in there as subject. Um, mm. But that led to lots of conversation. And very, very quickly, it became has. And... A lot of people know that jQuery had has, and the reason that jQuery had has is because when John Resig was making that work with CSS selectors, it was in specifications already for a long time. And like John, I was positive that any moment has was going to be supported by my browser. And like someday that was coming because it's in the specs, right? Um, and then it got punted to selectors level four. And for many, many years, we've been working on selectors level four. And uh, for a couple of times, we've discussed punting it to selectors level five. If I'm not mistaken, the thing that ultimately unblocked that had something to do with work that Egalia did, proving that it could be done performantly. Is that right? It absolutely is true. I, I wrote this post uh, in 2019 called Beyond Browser Vendors. And what it lays out is this, this concept that effectively, like there are just way too many problems to work on and not enough people. And we do work in this like completely uncoordinated fashion generally, right? Like that is, um, yeah, that's our default. There is no thing that says, um, your web engine team must contain this many people and they must all have the same throughput capability. <laughs> And all of the same diversities of specializations and nobody is allowed to get sick or have parental leave <laughs> or, right? I mean, everybody is managing their own queue and they all have very, very different abilities and budgets. And, and as you say, it is like just a giant, giant queue that you have to work. That means that sometimes, uh, unfortunately, far too much ideas don't advance because we're pretty sure we can't make them happen. We're pretty sure that that's like a burn of valuable time. So if there are things that have been discussed a lot that vendors say we can't just, we can't imagine how that could possibly work, then, you know, if you bring it up again, vendors are not super keen to want to burn their resources on that, you know? Uh, so if you have something questionable like has that really works in sort of the opposite way that all of the other CSS uh, optimizations have developed over the years, you have to like basically collect a lot of data. You have to build a prototype. You have to do a lot of research and like really show that it can be done and, you know, like unblock the sort of nuclear standoff 
that happens on just discussing whether you're willing to do it. Does it does it seem that way from your perspective, Philip? Yeah, I'm interested in these features that have seemed impossible for a long time, and then they happened. I haven't witnessed any of those, you know, up close myself. But I think well, container queries is like that, um, right. and and has we also is had like something that. to do with that. Yeah, yeah. It has yeah. Yeah. container queries. Uh, Grid, for that matter, <laughs> seemed impossible forever. We we didn't discuss this before when we talked about standardization, but. I think the role of prototyping is is really important just to prove that something is possible really can advance the discussion from yeah. you know we th we think this wouldn't be performant to you know having a prototype that works uh, fine um and I think even so the w2c it can seem kind of waterfall like where you first write the spec and and then you go and implement, but I think a lot of the time when it's working well. Uh, prototyping has happened sort of in the background and and got things rolling. There is a sort of a momentum effect that I I'm I sort of keep noticing. Uh, or like once something gets rolling, there's a certain momentum, and you sort of want to jump on that because if it stops moving, then it's going to be maybe even harder to get it moving again. So mm. if if there is interest, certainly I would. Uh, so let let's say I was working on you know full screen and and another vendor comes along and starts filing issues. And I would sort of jump on that and, and, and say, okay, it looks like they're working on this right now. So this would be a good time for me to prioritize that as well because, well, uh, collaboration works. Um, so yeah, that, that builds a kind of momentum for sure. Um, yeah. And I, I think that that is like largely what interop is, right? I mean, that is, like that is all of us going okay, collaboration really works. Uh, we can't afford to collaborate on all of the things, uh, but we can definitely afford to coordinate on a lot of things. And let's talk about what those things should be this year. Yeah, I also, as a, dev as a developer, not as a participant in Interop, but as someone you know, trying to look at it from the outside, I, what I really like about it is it tells me, this is what browser makers not only agree on, but think is achievable, right? Which maybe not everyone quite perceives that, but just that that idea of, oh, okay, so these are new things that are going to be worked on across the board for the next year is the plan. But now you can look at it and say, oh, everyone's working on container queries or cascade layers or whatever it is. And there can be, sometimes it can be, oh yeah, geez, this is a technology that has long been a pain point because it doesn't work right consistently across browsers and the browser makers have recognized that that's the case and they're working on fixing it. Or as with the Interop 2022 and 2023, wow, everyone's pulling together to implement color, like new color formats so that I can use OK Lab, you know, maybe in a year's time or less. Like I, I think that's actually it's a sign of a little bit more maturity in the space, right? Rather than every browser team running off and doing their thing, and sometimes they what they do overlaps and sometimes it doesn't. There's actually a, a sense of uh, a community, right? Of of a community of browser makers or engine makers, if you want to put it that way, saying. These are the things that we all have agreed to work on. Like between us, we have agreed to work on these things in the coming year. Yeah, community. That's 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 right. I, I do feel like we are coming together as as a community, and it's it's you know, a friendly a friendly bunch of people getting together and just trying to make things better. Right. And there's a there's a clever hack here actually that because we don't all want to promise like we're going to ship this thing for sure. Um, but you sort of there's a level of interaction, putting a number on it and uh, and uh, and a metric, and we're happy for these numbers to be out there and make us look bad if we don't work on it. But that's not exa not exactly the same as, as as promising. I think it's reasonable, you know, to assume that we announce this project and those are the things we're going to do. Of course, we wouldn't announce it if if that wasn't our, our intention. It's not the same as saying, here's our roadmap and here's a, here are the things that you can expect by such and such a date. Uh, that level of interaction, I think, helps. Hmm. Well, so 
what, what's in 2023 this year? Ooh, 26 things. Um, Can we talk about not just the things, but sort of like how we got the things and like what's different about 2023? Like, Yeah, let's do that. So how far do, back do we go? Well, we got together and said, let's do Interop 2023 and, and started to write down a, a process. And that process is one of you know, public proposals uh, for specific features. And we sort of announced to the world, hey, we're going to do another round of, of this Interop project. Please submit your proposals. And of course, us browser vendors submitted a lot of proposals, but we also got a really good number of proposals from, from sort of outside the, the, the core group of, 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 of companies. And in total, we got 87 unique proposals to, to deal with. And through a kind of long and laborious process that was narrowed down to 26, which includes some that are carried over from, from 2022. So I think the, the interesting part of the process is, is maybe, you know, how do we get from those 86 to the 26? Sorry, the 87 to the 26. <laughs> what happened there? I think it would be fair to say that not just in terms of a number, but in terms of like the diversity of things in here, the amount we're kind of biting off is more in 2023 oh yeah by a significant margin yeah it's absolutely a bigger uh chunk of work than than in 2022 which i'm really happy about and it's it's a like more diverse set of features 2022 was quite css heavy this year is as well but we also have features like like web codex um pointer and mouse events off-screen canvas so there's just more variety yeah because original compat was wasn't it all CSS or it was 80% CSS, something like that? It was, uh, it was all CSS. Yeah. Right. It was aspect ratio, flexbox, grid, transforms, and sticky positioning. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it's, I think it's been a natural evolution to, to start bringing in more stuff now that the model is sort of, I don't know if proven is the right word, but it's been demonstrated that this is going to be a regular thing. There's now, it's not just CSS, there's CSS, there's some HTML, there's some ECMAScript, there's, you know, um, like you said, web codecs, things like that, which is mm. also a good evolution. I really like that. But there was, yeah, there, I mean, there was this process uh, where we all, all the participants, um, so Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, Boku, Agalia, uh, Apple, shoot, I forgot Apple, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, you know, got on the, got together in calls and said, okay, what is, what is everyone's position on each of these proposals? Like, are you strongly in favor? I, you know, basically, you know, people indicated our teams indicated whether they were strongly in favor or if they were uh, opposed for some reason. And opposition could be anything from, well, somebody proposed this, but there's no specification yet. So we can't, we don't have anything to interoperate around, um, or it could be, you know, we don't have the resources um, to do everything and we don't think we can get to this one this year or, you know, really any other reasons. But those were all discussed, right? For each proposal individually, we're establishing whether we have consensus to include it. And if we don't, it's not included. Um, and I think that's what, what I talked about before with sort of filtering to the things we have consensus on. It's, it's important plus uh, consensus. And I think right. it has to be, it's very intentional, at least on my part, that it worked like this for 2022, that we can't have a process which tries to force someone to prioritize something they don't want to prioritize, because mm. I just don't see where that power would come from, <laughs> right? We're, we're different companies. Why would we do things we don't want to do? Yeah. So it's sort of built into the process that uh, we only do things that we can all agree to. And... Uh, we have almost a, a no questions asked policy. Like if someone says nah and doesn't want to elaborate, that's okay. Yeah. Um, because what else could we do? Uh, we can't force each other to, you know, reveal secrets uh, or do things that we don't want to do. Right. Yeah. Very true. And so, uh, like the the basic uh, step here was, you know, for each uh, proposal individually, do we have consensus? And then we were left with quite a lot of proposals, more than we finally included because we started you know, sort of uh, merging proposals into into bigger buckets. Uh, but we, we were left with a bunch of proposals and then we had this 
process of uh, uh, merging and renaming and, and coming up with things that would make sense and be explainable until we finally ended up with these uh, 26. We have like in the past years, like I don't think that we had a process the same way, but we did try to ask people, right? Like, what do you think would be, at least I did, <laughs> like, what do you think would be valuable to include in here? Yeah, it, it was, you know, in principle, an open process for 22 as well, but uh, we didn't, you know, announce it as broadly and we didn't get, maybe we didn't even get any proposals from non-browser vendors or, or non-participants. I don't think we did. Um, that, that's where I was going with this. And um, I think that, I know I said this in our, in our meeting as well, um, if we would have you know, coordinated something with the media outlets who are all very interested in any time all of the vendors come together. Because, you know, if we would have had an even wider call and we would have op left it open even longer, I think we'd have had, you know, 400 instead of 85 because everything is important to someone, right? And that is the challenge then is like, how do you... How do you prioritize it? It's very difficult. Uh, yeah. I don't know if we could deal with, you know, 10 times as many uh, proposals as we had <laughs> this time. I think we could not, honestly. I'm just being honest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and not just the number of proposals. I don't think, so I talked before about, you know, the value of, of trimming it down and not have this huge bucket of, of, of everything. Uh, so 26 is a big number. If we double that, it doesn't really fit on the screen anymore. It's, becomes hard to reason about. So I, I don't think we are going to keep doubling the size of the Interop program every year until we cover everything. I don't think that's, uh, that doesn't quite work together with focus because for something to be important, there has to be something left out. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think that there's a lot of value in having a relatively small forcing function number right a, a, a relatively small number as a forcing function somewhere around 25 is probably i think hitting up near the max it might even be too high already we'll see yeah yeah we've talked um, loosely about just limiting the number of focus areas to 26 or maybe 25 um, so that we have to finish things before we include new things and um, <clears throat> if we do that i we'd have to have a slightly different process uh, than what we've had in, in the previous years. Can I talk about a thing that we added this year that I think is the best thing and I have okay, real yeah. regrets that we didn't add it in the past? I, I don't know who actually did the uh, the addition this year, but uh, we have this uh, like interop chart at the bottom of thing where you can look at the progress over the course of the year, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's this like lines that, they go across. And so we have one for Chrome Edge or Edgium, as I like to call it. <laughs> uh, Me too. Firefox and Safari, I guess really this Gecko and WebKit. Um, but uh, then we have a fourth line that's called the interop line. And that's the number that passes in all three. So going back to that, like one interesting view that you could take is what is implemented in two of three browsers, right? That's like one way you can look at it. And we also talked about like, well, one way you could look at what is the standard is what's implemented in all three, regardless of what's in the spec and where, right? Uh, what has really high interoperability. But this way of looking at it is actually much, much better because it, when we see it on the chart, we see that, for example, you look at uh, across all active focus areas, like we have 65 to 80% in all the browsers, like at the beginning, but the compat line is only 50%. That means only 50% of things pass in all three browsers. And that's the one that matters at the end of the day, right? And of course, that's because in this sort of Venn diagram of, of, of passing or failing tests, we're not passing and failing exactly the same tests. So, so that end drop number can only be smaller than, than the, the, the browser uh, scores. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think it'll be exciting to see that number go up over, over the year and in, in past years, Getting past 90 has been a kind of milestone. I, I, I hope that'll happen both for all browsers individually and for this interop score. That'll be really great to see. I don't know if this makes me seem dull or something, but like I always have looked at those charts as if probably the lowest number on that chart was the degree of interop, right? 
But this additional line makes it very clear that, well, no, obviously that's not the case. And once you understand that, that is a really different kind of understanding. And I think a more valuable one. So does that just make you even more pessimistic? So it's even worse than you thought? Um, I mean, I think it's just more honest. I mean, it, I don't, I don't have a optimistic or pessimistic view of this, right? Like I think yeah. if I want to understand like a single metric, that one is the one that seems to be the one I should care about, you know, like, right. Um, if we want to put a single number on how well we're doing on these 26 focus areas, then yeah, I agree. That's, that's the one. Even in stable, we're already up to 70% in all active focus areas and it's no, it's only March. Yeah. I, I get the sense that we're going to make more progress faster this year. I, I think we'll get to 90 before, mm, you know, mid year say, uh, I think we're going to get, end up closer to 100 for the most part than than for Entrop 2022, and it's because like there's a lot more I think excitement around it, and it just feels bigger and more important this time around. Uh, Good, and uh, yeah, I'm really optimistic uh, about that that number. <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to make sure that we get covered? Well, maybe I just would like to hammer the point about you know developer pain points or developer needs again. The, the point of all of this is that the web platform isn't always a great place for developers. Uh, it's, I mean, yes, it's better than in the bad old days of spacer gifts and, and whatnot, but it's still plenty frustrating. And this, this difference is between browsers. It looks like the, the top pain point for developers. So sometimes I jokingly say that my job is to reduce the number of web developer tiers per second. And I think this is like the main way, <laughs> the, main, the main way that I'm uh, trying to do that. And um, do you file a TPS report at work? <laughs> no, I only, uh, only jokingly. Ideally, I think what this process or this uh, program would be is we get sort of input from developers about what matters most, where the most frustration is, and we have a shared understanding of those pain points, just like we did with the MDN DNA surveys and and the Compact Report and the State of CSS. And now none of these are perfect individually or, or even put together, but the, the more we have of this uh, information out there in public, and the more we have a shared understanding of where the biggest problems are, then we can prioritize together the things that we think will matter the most. And so ideally this turns into a little sort of engine uh, of improving developer happiness or success or, or what have you. And that's, that's what this all sh is anchored to uh, for me. Like I also love like the, the, the like web standards and the, and the details of testing and I can get deep into that, but yeah, it's for developers to cry less and, and at, at night in the end. Yeah, I think that's a good place to to end it. Um, thank you so much, Philip, for for uh, you know sharing your time and your insights with us. Well, thank you. It's been a been a pleasure, and let's keep entropping. Yeah. <laughs>